our next speaker is Asher Lopetin, who's uh, a rabbi at uh, Anshe Salom B'nai Israel Congregation. He received his ordination from Yeshiva's Brisk and also from Yeshiva University in New York. He holds an MPhil in Medieval Arabic Thought from Oxford, as well as a BA in International Relations and Islamic Studies from Boston University. Um, he's a recipient of many awards, including a Rhodes Scholarship. Um, and the title of his talk is Creative Interpretation in Halakha and Sharia. In the quotes, I guess. <laughs> what is the definition of public prayer? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, especially as a rabbi in a wonderful and amazing academic uh, conference uh, like this. And actually, it's interesting. Yesterday, I got a call from someone complaining about the use of the word Sharia. So uh, I could have, had I heard this already, I said, you are right. Now, it was probably coming from a different direction than you were talking about. But, uh, but still, I would have had something clever to say to her. So, uh, but that's you know, the life of a rabbi, which is uh, great. I'm, I'm passing, we're, thank you, we're passing through uh, around an article um, that um, was written, is from the Forward, the Daily Forward today, uh, online. And uh, it talks about this, how uh, powerful this issue is, a human issue of the participation of women in the services. Uh, I'm an Orthodox rabbi, and there's a lot of discussion on the listservs that I'm on uh, that talk a lot about you know, the minutiae of the details and this, and can we do this, and slippery slope, and all sorts of uh, uh, ways of looking at this issue. This article is really uh, very much from the human side. Um, and it also involves a, uh, a rabbi who's an ordainee of the rabbinical college that I'm going to be going to uh, in a couple of months. So uh, you can read it if what I'm saying gets dull, uh, feel free to, to read it. Uh, and um, I wanted to uh, really uh, use Islamic law uh, and Islamic interpretation of law uh, as a support for an idea that I thought as an Orthodox, a modern Orthodox rabbi, to address the issue of women's participation in synagogue services. So mainly, I'm thinking from the point of view of a rabbi and an Orthodox rabbi that feels compelled to come up with a, an accurate interpretation and a traditional interpretation of Jewish law. And I'm using uh, small elements of uh, Islamic law and Islamic tradition to be supportive. And uh, this is, I guess, something new. It's not normally uh, discussed on my listservs at Well Islam Believes This. But I think as I present it, uh, it, it might be helpful in this the sense of that when the two religions uh, resonate with each other, and when we hear things so much in common, uh, they give strength to each other. So there's almost a uh, sort of the, the uh, whole is greater than the parts. Uh, and so let me start with actually one of the easier issues uh, that we talk about in, I'll say, in Orthodox uh, circles. Uh, and that is about uh, women leading services for other women in prayer. Uh, you normally you'd think that that shouldn't be any question whatsoever. The, the Bible talks about Miriam dancing with the women, uh, so clearly women have led women. Uh, in Eastern Europe there was, uh, when, when women began to go to synagogues, there were really separate synagogues for women, or there was a wall. Uh, and the women, in order to know what to, to pray, and many of them uh, were, were illiterate, uh, they had a zogaka. They had a woman who was reading the prayers to them, and they repeated the prayers. So this is not an innovation. This is something that goes way back. And in fact, in many of the very, from very religious uh, day schools, like Beis Yaakov's, uh, the girls daven in the morning. There are no guys around. The girls daven in the morning, and there is somewhat of a leader. So you would think uh, that it's not such a problem, that there's clear precedent within uh, Judaism for a woman leading uh, other women. Uh, so we'll get back to actually that in uh, Judaism it has been controversial in traditional Judaism and orthodoxy in particular. But uh, let's take a very brief look uh, in Islam. Uh, and there are, uh, and by the way, you know, I, I really look forward to a discussion and uh, uh, either pushback or support or whatever it is from people that in the audience that know much more about this than I do. But there are hadith, there are traditions of Aisha and Um Salama, of the wives of the Prophet, who uh, led women in prayer and stood among them in the obligatory prayer. 
Uh, and uh, there are many different traditions like this. Uh, and uh, both, uh, both of Aisha and Umm Salama. Uh, and the, uh, it really seems on the surface, if you look at many of these traditions, you could bring a powerful argument that uh, women leading women in prayer is something that is very well uh, accepted uh, in Islam. But it's not so clear. So some of the schools of fiqh, uh, the Shafi, Hanbali, and Hanafi, uh, in general accept it. The Hanafi are, le which is a little surprising because sometimes they're nor normally considered a more progressive uh, school or modern, whatever you want to um, uh, sort of tweak those terms. But uh, the Hanafis are less in favor of this. And uh, the, Malikis, uh, uh, the Maliki school feels it's prohibited. So even though there are many traditions, many hadith in Islam that have uh, show a precedent for women leading prayers, it's not so clear that women are allowed to lead prayers, even for women, uh, in congregational life. And this might be the beginning of a distinction. How do you explain uh, traditions? You could always say that it's in a, an inaccurate tradition. It's not a tradition we accept. Uh, but you could also say that when Aisha and Umm Salama were leading the prayers, it was not done in a congregational setting. It was done in a more of a private setting. And that's sort of the direction uh, that I, uh, I want to get to. Uh, in the Jewish world, women's tefillah groups, and this is almost like a footnote, women prayer groups have been actually, they've come into, uh, they've been normalized a little bit. In fact, some of the rabbis that are most vociferous against women leading uh, services for men and women themselves have women prayer groups where women are leading services for just women in their synagogues. And I always get frustrated because uh, some of them are like so religious and leading the charge against women leading services, mixed services. And I say, but you're not religious. You're a sinner. You know, you have a women's uh, tefillah group. You have women leading service for women. And many of the modern Orthodox or centrist Orthodox decisors some say even Rav Soloveitchik, uh, but uh, Rav J.B. Uh, 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 Soloveitchik. Um, others uh, of his students definitely at uh, uh, Yeshiva University. Uh, some call there's a group of five uh, rabbis in the uh, late 70s in the, in the, who were opposed to this. Uh, they were opposed to women leading services for women. Uh, and um, I don't know if we have to go uh, into such detail uh, here because that's not my main focus, but just to uh, what were some, what could possibly uh, be the problem, because it's all women there, uh, and the issues were actually that um, if the, the main issue, first of all, might be considered a break from tradition, but as we see, it's not such a break from the tradition from Miriam and from Eastern Europe, uh, but also mainly what they were looking at was that it's better for a woman to pray when there is a full minyan, there's a full quorum, which traditionally includes ten men. In other words, women praying on their own, it's something that's kind of nice, but if they have an opportunity of praying in a regular synagogue with ten men, that is much better. So if we could actually show that a traditionally a woman could lead services for uh, men and women in a traditional setting with a quorum of ten men, then these rabbis, if they would agree to that, would say that's much better than a woman leading services for women. So, in other words, the more religious option, the stricter option, might not be a women's tefillah group, just women with women, but actually a woman leading services in a regular congregational setting with men and women. So what does, um, this is where we're going to get to uh, the main point that I, I want to focus on. Uh, what does Islam say about uh, women uh, leading services for men and women? And there don't seem to be as many uh, hadith, uh, but there is one famous hadith that, that I, uh, I've seen uh, uh, by, about Umm Waraka, that uh, a companion of uh, the Prophet, or living, in a contemporary, living contemporaneous with the Prophet Muhammad, where the Prophet apparently lets her uh, lead services, but kadifi baitiki, she has to read them, she has to lead the salah in her house. It has to be fee baitiki, in your house. 
Uh, and it is for the Ahla Dariha, it is for the Ala Dariha, the, uh, the people of her dar, of her house, her neighborhood, her community. It's not clear what that means, but it is clear that it has to be in a home setting. Uh, and this is what compels some or allows some Muslim thinkers uh, to say that, you know what? If it's a, a private matter, if it's just in a home, and maybe even the men of the home don't know exactly how to pray properly, then she could lead it. It's private, and there's no problem of, uh, of modesty. There's no uh, problem of uh, issues that come with men who might not know her. So that is permissible. Uh, now, you can uh, debate this and extend this. You can say Ahla Daria is the, uh, the people, it might be the whole neighborhood, it might be a huge group of people. But um, I want to focus on this idea that in Islam itself, it seems the Prophet was saying, you have to stay in your house. And I'd like to use this idea to take it back to uh, my uh, Jewish roots to look at... Um, why is that significant? What is the significance of, let's say, the prophet? Again, if you want to accept, not everyone accepts that uh, tradition, but if you do accept that tradition, uh, why would it be okay for the woman to lead the services, perhaps mixed services, men and women, in her house, but not in the public sphere? And uh, this, I forgot which uh, came first, whether I had heard uh, this distinction in Islam between the public and private, where private a woman could lead mixed services, but in the public sphere she couldn't, whether I had heard that first or whether I had thought about this in the Jewish realm, where there was a discussion of Jews, Jewish women, uh, leading services for men or for women, um, and that's where I thought normally the complaint about that is kivod hatzibur, is that it's not honorable for the community. Uh, and this is a very uh, famous uh, Braita. There's also a Tosefta that is similar to it. So a tradition in the Talmud, in uh, Tractate Megillah 23a, the rabbis taught, Tan Rabbanan, Hakolo, Luminian Shiva, everyone goes, counts towards the seven obligatory readings of the Torah on the Sabbath. Even a minor, Gafilu Isha, even a woman. So it first of all says that a woman can do it, that it will work for a woman doing it. But the rabbi said, Amru Chachamim Isha Loti Krava Torah, a woman should not read from the Torah. This is normally accepted, a woman should not be one of these seven. Miknei Chavod Tzibur, for the honor of the Tzibur, of the community. Now, there's a lot of discussion in this in Jewish circles. Does this change? You know, maybe what was honorable for the Tzibor uh, 2,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago was honorable for the community then changes. Maybe that's something that evolves, and that requires really a uh, maybe following a school of thought in Jewish law that thinks things can evolve. But most, uh, I would say, orthodox halachic authorities, legal authorities, would say, no, you know, how do you know that things change? So they might come up with something else, that there's another value. There, yes, it's a value to have respect for the community, but there's another value of respect for humanity. And if you read this article, I think that sort of brings it out to a sick woman who, a uh, tragedy, uh, her uh, uh, neurological um, problems, and she wants to do a little bit of Torah, of, of leading, in this case it's not Torah, it's leading a Friday night service. Uh, you know, how, of course we have a value of respect for the community, but what about the value of respect for an individual, respect for human life, all that kind of stuff. So that's another direction people can take, and there have been a lot of arguments about that. But when I saw this, what struck me was this idea of kvod sibur, that we're worried about the uh, honoring the community, the honor of the community. <laughs> And, uh, or the public, however you want to uh, explain that word, tzibur. Uh, tzibur is sort of a gathering, tzibur, coming together. And what is this honor of the community? I mean, you could say it's just, uh, some people say it's not honorable if a woman reads instead of a man reads. There are many different interpretations. One of the most 
authoritative, centrist, orthodox uh, post scheme of today is um, Rav Herschel Schachter. And uh, he writes uh, in, uh, online, um, in the laws of reading the Torah, he says the Shulchan Aruch quotes from the Talmud that although according to the law of reading Torah, a woman could get an aliyah. I mean, there's no problem with it. That's what the Talmud said. But he says, Kvod Atzibur, this honor to the community, is a matter of tzniut, is a matter of the modesty of the woman. It's not modest for the woman to lead this service. So if we go with this logic, he says everyone has the image of God within them, uh, and one of the things that you're most godly like is when you're keo mistater, when, you're, when God is hidden, when you're modest. And God prefers to hide in Sina. Therefore, um, I guess we let women uh, have this aspect of godliness. A little bit of, of apologetics here. Uh, but, uh, but basically what he's saying is that to protect, and bear with me, is to protect the dignity of the woman, we do not have her paraded to uh, lead services. But that's kvod hatzibur. That's when it's dealing with a public showing of this woman who is leading services. And interestingly, in halacha, in Jewish law, in uh, the area of uh, saying kiddush, of uh, saying the uh, paragraphs and the prayers that sanctify the Sabbath, or uh, in uh, the case even of uh, Megillah, reading Megillah, or there is a distinction between a woman doing it publicly and a woman doing it for members of her household. So this harkens back to the Hadith where the Prophet said, only do it in your household. The Aruch HaShulchan says, Kevan Barabim who that if a woman is doing something rabim in the public sphere, then it's zila milta. Then it's demeaning to her. Same kind of idea. They're lumping the same concept, and Rav Shechter is, of kvod atzibor, that it's not, it's not honorable to the woman. It's demeaning if it's done in a public way. But if it's done in a private way, and the Mishnah Bura says that as long as, you know, it's all members of her household hearing this prayer sanctifying the Sabbath, the Kiddush, then it's totally proper. And in fact, there are other laws that distinguish between a public synagogue and a private house. For instance, you have to give the first reading of the Torah, the first aliyah, to a Kohen, to a priest. If it's done in a public sphere, you have to. If it's done in the house, the halacha is that you don't have to do it. The Mishnah Baruch says no, because it's a private sphere. And um, also issues of supporting the synagogue. If there's one synagogue for the whole town, it's a public synagogue, everyone is required in that town to give money towards that synagogue. But even if there are other synagogues, and each synagogue is a sort of a private space, then you can't compel anyone to give money to that synagogue. Uh, so... Finally, the, the, the fourth point of this distinction is that sometimes you have, you have all these laws of respecting a synagogue, but if people treat it as a home, like scholars are in the synagogue and in the Beit Midrash learning all day, then our medieval sources, the Ron says that, well, first the Talmud says in Megillah again, uh, Beta de Rabbanan, the Beit Midrash, the synagogue, the place of learning, becomes Beta Dirabanan, becomes the house of these people studying there. The Fisha Omdim Sham Kol Hayom, the Ron says, because they're there the whole day. There's a transformation that can occur from a synagogue becoming a, uh, being a public place to becoming a private space. And if it does become that private space, then, as in the laws of a woman doing Kiddush, and in other areas, then a woman is certainly allowed to lead religiously and lead ritual, uh, ritual rituals and uh, services, reading Torah. And, I mean, there's a discussion about services for other reasons, perhaps, but this idea that kavod hatzibur, that you have to show honor to the woman by not parading her publicly, 
falls away if you're saying, saying that the synagogue is private space. And that's really my argument uh, in, about today's synagogues, both in the, the way they are, their synagogues people pay membership in general in America and synagogues. They are private space. They are private communities. And also, ideally, they should be like homes. They should be warm places. People should come to them and should not feel like a stranger. People should come to the synagogue and feel welcomed and feel like they're part of the home. And I think that um, if we can turn these synagogues that we have, the public arena, which is a place of anonymity, it's a place where no one knows who you are, no one cares who you are, you're just there, to private space. It's a space where people do care about each other and it's a sense of community and a sense of family. Then the rabbis who said that women should not read from the Torah, get one of the Aliyot, the rabbis who had other issues of leading Kiddush, other ritual leadership issues for women, they would say, well, we were talking about Sibor. We were talking about Rabin. We were talking about public space. But if it's private space, then there's no woman. Then there is, there's no problem. There is a woman. There is no problem. There is modesty. She is amongst people who care for her, who would not want to embarrass her. There is... God hiding, as it were, inside, because these spaces are inside. And so I think that in the um, Islamic tradition, there is this sense that if it's in the home, then a woman can lead services, and perhaps for men as well. The question really is, are we transforming, are we willing, do we want to transform our synagogues and our mosques? into private space, not exclusive private space, but private spaces that are open. The model of the home that is hospitable, that brings strangers in and welcomes them, but treats them not like strangers, treats them like family. I actually think that the Jewish community needs to move in this direction, that we actually will not succeed in America in keeping people part of the community, the Jewish community, if our synagogues are just public space, but if we can bring people into them and they can feel like they are homes and they are private, welcoming space where everyone is valued and everyone is, in a sense, ahladad, our people of our family, then I think we can really succeed not only in the issue of allowing women to lead in a ritual way, but also in really building up, up a community that is connected to each other and that is able to pass the tradition from one generation to the next. Questions? Yes. Uh, um, first of all, thank you very much. I, um, from a, a lot of perspective, I've actually never heard that distinction um, made before. I think it's a really fascinating and interesting one. Um, I wonder about your thoughts on another way of, of looking at, at the issue, um, primarily because I myself also very interested in these issues. Um, and I've, I've uh, thought about um, the issue um, in terms of uh, kind of looking at the uh, the way I see it, I think, uh, especially with regard to the question of women leading mixed gender congregational prayers, um, in, in Judaism at least, the, the um, in Orthodox Judaism, the conversation has sort of crystallized, I think, at this point around several different um, views, and I think it's kind of um, crystallized um, along the lines of when pressed, everyone will have to agree that there's a legitimate technical legal argument to be made either way, um, both for permissibility and for um, prohibiting the practice. Um, the sources can be read and interpreted in, in, in either way, whether you would say it's strained or not strained, it's a, it's a fundamentally legitimate reading of the sources, and that the disagreement has kind of crystallized around the meta halakhic issues, um, for example, questions of of, sneot, of modesty, questions of the intent of, of people um, looking to innovate new practices, um, 
the concern for conservatism and continuity of tradition. Um, and and um, I thought about and, and suggested that uh, in Islam, which is more recently dealing with this similar issue, and, and in the United States particularly since 2005, um, when there was the um, famous, or I don't know how famous, but uh, uh, Amina Wadud, who's the professor, held a, uh, organized a, a, a female-led mixed-gender prayer um, in Manhattan. Um, and there, there, there were many responses to this, and, and the, at this point, from what I can tell, the discussion is, the disagreement within the Islamic community is, is a technical, um, legal discussion about interpretation of the technical legal sources, about, about the, 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 um, the uh, persuasiveness of, of, of the hadith with which you mentioned, and, and of the um, persuasiveness of, of uh, the consensus of jurists since then, who have held one way and possibly the other way on the issue. Um, and I, I think that there's a great value in, in kind of accepting that there is legitimate disagreement um, over the technical interpretation of the sources, that we can agree to disagree. There are different ways to interpret the sources, and um, leaving and, and kind of basing the argument on one way or the other um, on these kind of meta issues, which I and I think you have these uh, devices and, and tools within the Islamic jurisprudential tradition as well to make similar kinds of arguments based on tradition, um, based on concerns for modesty and fitna. Um, and uh, um, uh, continuing, uh, continuing prior practices in the absence of proof, uh, inclusive proof to the contrary. And I wonder what, if you think that that uh, framing the argument on, in terms of those broader principles is is a useful way of doing it, or is that's actually a not uh, not not a useful way of doing it. I am fascinated by what you're saying because I think it's, it's a very, uh, it would be very healthy for the Jewish community uh, and I'm part of the Orthodox community to, to look at Islam and say, wait a second, why are they as not worked up about these huge meta issues as we are? I got, uh, related to that article, I got an email from a, a rabbi who says, you know, this is feminism taking over and it's this taking over and it's, it's these are forces beyond our control. I mean, it could be, but I think you're right. I think it's a healthy uh, to see that Islam is not as worked up as we are. Then why are what's going on within us? I think that'd be very healthy because we would always expect Islam, you know, fundamentalists and all that to be worked up. And I think that's a very interesting point. And if it could just get in all these kind of things, we just step back for a second and think more reasonably. And so I, I think that's that's it's a fascinating approach. I don't want to take too much credit. We got pretty about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, it, is, it is a fascinating distinction. There actually is in the Talmud the distinction between Beta Knesset Shal Rabbi and Beta Knesset Shal Rafid, the public versus the private synagogue. I don't know if it can play out uh, uh, this way. Uh, but I, I, I would say this also uh, as um, uh, the proud father of, uh, of a daughter who leads an orthodox uh, all-female, uh, uh, they don't call it a congregation because they haven't seceded from the, uh, they make it a point uh, not to. Uh, but I would suggest uh, another tack. If, if it's a question of basically women assuming a more public role, uh, then I think that a better tack is that in the halakhic system, the Beta Midrash, the, the place of study, has a higher sanctity than the synagogue. Uh, the Talmud, you, you can sell a synagogue to make a Beta Midrash, but you can't sell a Beta Midrash to make a synagogue. In the Beta Midrash, actually, there are virtually no, none of these restrictions. Um, it, it, um, uh, there are virtually not, not, none of these restrictions. And the parallel to it is as follows. I, I, I've actually it, tried to advise young women that if they really want to play a role, a religious leadership role, they should go into the field of Jewish studies. And the reason is because, and teach Jewish law. Because when it comes to 
an opinion, for example, on what is a budget, not budget, but what is a Jewish point of view on X, Y, Z. They no longer consult rabbis, they consult Jewish studies people. Uh, and therefore, that ah, is that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in, in that, in, 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 the one that is more independent, not uh, and whatever. So I mean, this is is a question. But the idea of just one last point: the idea of a service, you know, where women do some parts and men do other parts. Uh, in 1983, when the uh, group that the, that I still lead. Uh, 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 seceded from from the uh, conservative movement in the United States, an organizing group of traditional Judaism. Uh, we consulted, uh, whom we consider to be in many of the people in the world's greatest homos, Professor Sully Berman, his memory be blessed. Uh, and he indicated, yes, on technical grounds, yes, he said, but he said to have this type of synagogue where men do one thing, women do another thing. He said, subjects to, and he invoked a value that I haven't heard anybody else, it makes the, the service look ridiculous. We can do this, we can do that, and, 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 and everything else like that. He's in the egalitarian room. But, but I think that that distinction is that the synagogue uh, really was never meant to be the major institution in the community. And that the the Dedham the House of, uh, of Learning, uh, is one where there are far fewer halakhic impediments to doing what I think you were trying to do. So a couple of points. You made many good points, uh, uh, powerful points. First, uh, it's funny, Ravon Soloveitchik used that same term that looks silly. I mean, and one thing I would say when you read that article, um, it's nothing about silliness. And, and, uh, and I understand, I mean, I'm a student of Ravon Soloveitchik. These are great minds. But they might just not get it, what, a, what women feel when they're leading, whether it's an all-women's group, or what a bat mitzvah girl feels when she's leading a, uh, an orthodox bat mitzvah girl, a service with men and women. So um, it's, it's just funny, I didn't realize that they both said the same thing. Uh, and it's, it's not a joke. I mean, it, it doesn't make anything look silly. No one reads this article about uh, the rabbi letting the woman lead and say, that's so silly. Um, uh, but or bizarre. I mean, so, but the other thing I would say, uh, just two more quick things. One is that, yes, there is this talk about, and Saul Berman talks about the, this, uh, that, you know, let women learn. We, we've, uh, women, we didn't know, we weren't always allowed to learn all the texts or have schools, but now, for some reason, that's happened. Uh, and um, let's stick to that. But, you know, that's also leading the direction of women wanting to become rabbis. Uh, and there again, I don't think you could really stop this. I don't think you can limit women to, well, we'll give you the, the Beit Midrash learning, and learning is even more important, or in more ultra-Orthodox circles, we'll give you the, you know, the home and the household work, that's holier than anything. The synagogue is just a men's club, forget about that, you know. <laughs> I don't think that's, that's going to work. I mean, I'm happy for a woman to feel where she is fulfilled, uh, where she feels spiritually fulfilled, that's great, and she just wants to learn that's great also. I just think we have to be open to these venues. The other thing I want to say, uh, just quickly, about the Beit Midrash, um, and Rabbi Broid was actually very helpful in this, this transformation, you know, that, that it, the Beit Midrash is the area where I think we can learn a lot from. You're learning from the point of view just it's a place of learning. I see it as a place of real transformation where the people that are involved, it shows that that can be a home where a lot of the laws, you're right, of the synagogue are put aside, and maybe also these laws of that only men can lead also in that kind of surrounding where the people in the Beit Midrash and Learning Center really make it their home. So a lot to, to discuss, yes. Thank you. I see the hands, but we'll, we'll defer them to the, to the more public discussion or the open discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlotte Anishevi von, von Robert, who teaches in the Religious Studies Department and Jewish Studies Program at Stanford University. She teaches undergraduate classes in religion and gender, religion and politics, and religion and ethics, although her field of research is rabbinic literature broadly, but in particular the halakhic discourse of the classic rabbinic texts. Her first book, dealing with the laws of what later became known as family purity, was awarded the Salo Bar Baron Prize for best first book in Jewish studies of that year, and was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award in the category of scholarship. 
She has also co-edited the Cambridge Companion to the Talmud and Rabbinic Literature, as well as the American edition of the collected essays by the German-American Jewish philosopher of religion, Jacob Tobis. Among her current projects, she is working on one of uh, she, among the current projects she's working on, one is of which this talk is a part, is on Jewish identity and territoriality in diaspora. And the name of the title of the talk is American Arab Halakha in Public Space. Uh, so uh, thank you now at the, as the last panelist of the last panel of the conference. <laughs> uh, I hope you stay away, but it's uh, a special thank you uh, to Sam and Mark for inviting me. Um, and when I first initially got the invitation, I, um, I accepted it with uh, a somewhat of uh, trep trepidation because I, uh, I'm not a lawyer and I have not studied uh, American law. And the only qualification I have to talk about issues in, I mean, somewhat about issues in American law is my citizenship test three, three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the questions that you get in that, in that test are sort of uh, rudimentary, shall we say. Um, but uh, what I thought that I could contribute when, uh, when I talked with Sam about this also to this, what has turned out to be a wonderful and very engaging conference from which um, I'm also learning quite a bit is a few reflections on a specific case study of an instantiation of Jewish law in America that takes, most, uh, pl takes place most literally in the public square. And uh, Professor Freeman already talked a little bit about this uh, earlier this morning, which is referred to in rabbinic halachic Hebrew, Hebrew as the Eruv, which I'm going to leave untranslated for uh, a few seconds here. <laughs> <laughs> Not to, uh, it's just very, uh, it's one of those terms that are almost impossible to translate. But nonetheless, it can be demystified, I think, uh, in, in some meaningful ways. So um, I have thought and written about this particular aspect of Sabbath law uh, a few essays, uh, and mostly from the perspective uh, as a scholar of classic Jewish texts, uh, with interest in cultural anthropology rather than from the perspective of American law about which, as I said, I know shamefully little but had uh, gotten much more interested during the last, uh, during the last year to, uh, or two especially since law contacted me. Uh, so uh, I wanted to start this out with uh, uh, um, mentioning to you that last uh, August I received an email from a law firm uh, in New York, and I talked a little bit with Michael about this, um, uh, that was last August, um, where the law firm says the following, Ms. von Roberts, um, and I'm not saying that for self-congratulation right now, but uh, there's a point. Um, I know, so that's already it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm an attorney in New York, and my firm is involved in a litigation concerning a proposed Eruv. We re represent a group of persons from diverse backgrounds, but largely Reformed Jews, who are opposing the Eruv on constitutional establishment grounds. Your name has been given to us as the leading scholar in this area, <laughs> and a brief blah, blah, blah. Uh, we are interested in an academic perspective on the issue, both to better educate ourselves about it, but also for the purpose of steering clear of some of the understandably emotional or political responses that tend to arise when it is approached from a purely religious angle. In that regard, the litigation is likewise focused on the purely constitutional legal questions and is not in any way attempting to advance an anti-Orthodox anti sentiment. Because, yes, it is, actually. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, they offered me the possibility of serving as a consultant. So, um, it only took a little uh, while to consult with Ralph Google uh, <laughs> and figure out that the Elf controversy that this, that this lawyer was, talk was talking about had garnered some uh, notoriety by being featured on John Stewart's Daily Show, <laughs> which is in the Hamptons. So, that's a controversy that he also mentioned. Uh, so accordingly, the Orthodox community in West Hampton Beach was trying to, um, to institute an ELF and to make sense of this uh, in a few, with a few preliminary uh, definition, no, definitional notes, uh, so I want to premise this a little bit, 
as per Jewish legal tradition, or th there's three points that I want to make to be precise, bear with me now for, um, for a few minutes because we need these data to make sense of the controversy, I think, and the challenge for the neat confinement of religion to the private sphere that this poses. Uh, so as I said, uh, it is part of, the Elf is part of rabbinic Sabbath law with very little, um, with re very little or no biblical roots, and that's sort of in part self-acknowledged in the classical sources where right, we talk about Sabbath law as mountains hanging on a hair. Uh, according to Jewish legal tradition broadly, and here I mean the, the, the pre-Rabbinic Jewish legal tradition that includes the Dead Sea Scrolls and a number of other legal texts that are arguably uh, uh, proto-Rabbinic and non-Rabbinic, the act of carrying or moving an object from a private domain, or your house or tent, into the public domain is prohibited uh, as is carrying within the public domain or from one pr private domain to another. Uh, and so the broad, uh, the, the broad le Jewish legal tradition here is the prophets, the pro prophetic text, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, etc. Only the rabbis, as the progenitors of Jewish, Jewish law as we know it, came up with a, with a way to circumvent this. Um, so here's the three aspects that I want to discuss a little bit with you, which is first, um, the various pri so the ways on how to circumvent this. Uh, various private domains, including the semi-public sphere that they share, and in, in the ancient Jewish text and classical Jewish text is the wall courtyards in which the, the residences are um, situated, as in, in Mediterranean uh, urban uh, landscape, can be merged and unified, and that was the, 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 the Hebrew verb of the noun um, uh, connotes, merging and unifying, if they share a symbolic meal, and the nature of this symbolic meal evolves over the centuries. Now, in, in the earliest uh, text for this, in the, uh, the Mishnah, the foundational text for rabbinic law, in the late second or third century, it's bread or flour that is collected from the residents that share in this institution that is then uh, baked or, um, every, after, every Friday afternoon. And that has to be de deposited into one of the houses, not consumed. Uh, and then since Gaonic times, uh, the period that uh, Lina also talked a lot about, uh, uh, this is reduced to once a year, and this, as you may imagine, only one kind of food that can retain its nature as food for a whole year, which is matzah. Even though one can argue whether... Uh, <laughs> uh, so that can, uh, since medieval uh, developments can be deposited in the synagogue, even though there are some debates whether it's actually private residence. Um, and there also are some practices where the matzah is nailed to the wall, uh, which provokes some interesting symbolic misreadings. Uh, and um, there's, a controversy, there's a controversy in southern Germany in the 15th, 15th or 16th century where the apostates actually go to the Christians and say, look what they do because the matzah gets always exchanged right around the time of Pesach when the new matzah has to be uh, put up. So that's a whole interesting um, medieval sort of mis uh, um, misreading of that. But that, and nowadays the, the, the practice is to put the matzah box in the rabbi's office. Uh, so now once merged, uh, the elf, that's what that means, so it, everyone comes up with mergers or something like that. In such a manner, the boundaries between them are between the private residences are symbolically dissolved, and now I can leave my house with my keys in, in my pocket or pushing my kids' stroller. So the, the kids' stroller is the most is the favorite sort of uh, practice that's evoked in advocating for the elf because that sort of includes women in contemporary Jewish life, supposedly and whatnot. So though not immediately common uh, though not immediately commonsensical, if as if ritual ever is, it would seem easy enough to fit this within the place where religion belongs in liberal democracy, namely in the private sphere. Let them Jews do as they please and put a matzah box in the in their synagogue, just as the Eucharist is a matter of church practice behind the closed doors of the church. So, however, uh, why should we care? However, the non-Jewish public does get involved in two further requirements internal to the system itself for such a circumvention of the original Sabbath prohibition to be effective. And these are the two. Now, if there are non-Jews living in the neighborhood, so to speak, 
and the classic sources here importantly assume that Jews do live among, uh, intermingled with non-Jews, including in the land of Israel. Uh, they cannot be part of the food merger, since they are not, the non-Jews it is, since they are not subject to the Sabbath prohibitions to begin with, and therefore not subject to the same nomos. But neither can they be ignored, since they may have a share in the shared domain, the shared courtyards or not. So therefore the classical sources introduce a further practice of renting from the non-Jew, symbolic, uh, symbolic rent for the purposes of uh, the Sabbath observing. And this also originally was once a week, like the food merger. Uh, so the Jewish neighbor would march over to the non-Jewish neighbor and ask him to rent for the Sabbath his share in the shared domain. Now the classic sources consider this a rather fraught moment of Jewish-non-Jewish -Jewish interaction with great potential again for miscommunication since to begin with it is not entirely clear what it is that is being rented. Is it the right of domain as per permission to allow the Jewish neighbors to carry on the Sabbath? But from the non-Jewish perspective they presumably already have the right of domain. And how is the rent assessed? Which uh, uh, here you get an incredibly interesting discussion in the Babylonian Talmud on what the reaction, projecting onto the non-Jew, what his what his reaction is going to be once the non-Jew shows, uh, once the Jew shows up, which is to think, what is this Jew up again? Uh, what is he up to again? If it's real rent for the value of the property, surely he's not going to give it back to me at the end of the Sabbath. If, however, he only gives me a penny or symbolic rent, it must be witch witchcraft. Mm -hmm. So that whole discussion, in the way, already uh, takes uh, right, right um, uh, anticipates what uh, happens in a lot of the con uh, contemporary um, controversies. And then the medieval commentator Rashi also actually does uh, consider this a social engineering trick, and those, that, that issue has come up in, again in the con contemporary controversies. That in other words, the rabbis come up with that practice because it's going to be so cumbersome that Jews will move, eventually move away. Meaning no Jewish source will uh, explicitly legislate Jews should live, live by themselves in enclaves. But here's a way on how we sort of try to get Jews to move away from an immediate neighborhood with non-Jews. But that's only one reading of that practice. So this early practice too evolved over the centuries and nowadays the practice is for drawing up contracts for a number of years, 99 years, whatever, for a symbolic amount of money from the appropriate non-Jewish uh, representatives. And we'll get to one example um, towards the end. So let me emphasize what it is of in interest here is that this additional requirement for effecting the possibility to carry and push strollers in the neighborhood on the Sabbath involves by logic of the, of the system itself, the non-Jewish public indeed requires the involvement of the non-Jewish public, uh, perhaps in principle somewhat parallel to the selling of 11 before the Passover mentioned by um, Rabbi Dr. Novak yesterday. But this here is a much more public version um, of, of, of thereof, I think. So lastly, the third element, which is the one that's the most uh, notorious ones in the uh, con contemporary controversies, is another involvement of the public, which however was not foreseen, arguably, in that manner by the classic sources and is, is incidental to modernity. The classic sources of Jewish law, from Mishnah to Talmud, etc., require that where there are no contingent boundaries, such as a walled shared courtyard, the walled alleyways of the Mediterranean urban architecture, and eventually the walled cities in medieval times, some intervention in the urban landscape is necessary in order to establish boundary markers, mostly of a symbolic uh, kind. And here I spare you the halachic details, and Professor Freeman has talked a little bit about, uh, about this, but there are many, 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 many volumes, Salachic volumes, written on what qualifies their, thereby. So suffice it to say here that the contingent boundary is drawn by pre mostly by pre-existing boundary markers, fences, riverbanks, walls, etc., that already exist in the urban landscape. And then gaps are supplemented with symbolic gateways, represented by the infamous post with fishing lines spanning them. Uh, the supposedly most visible uh, presence of Jews in the urban landscape. Um, or existing telephone poles are used uh, but need to be supplemented with, uh, uh, with a signal plastic stripe 
etc., to, uh, to establish that contingent boundary. Now, the, the kind of intervention, which is not actual war, wars, and that needs to be uh, emphasized again and again, and vision in the classical sources did not raise any worry that anyone else in the town and city would object to. Um, however, in the defortified cities of modernity, and especially in contemporary American cities, and any kind of intervention in the urban landscape is subject to all kinds of, uh, um, of administrative and public review. So also in this particular requirement of Jewish law. If, um, just to clarify the lesson, I mean, the ancient sources they never envisioned that, that putting anything in the urban landscape would uh, raise a, a, a controversy. That's really only uh, an effect of the modern uh, urban landscape. And here this is a little bit contra contrary uh, yesterday to what you mentioned, and that was only in a footnote, that Sabbath law is actually firmly entrenched in the private sphere because this whole thing actually in, in fairly uh, um, firmly entren entrenched in the public sphere. So let me return to the controversy in West Hampton Beach. Well documented on the website, um, all the documents for, of the last five years uh, are on the website. So this is a classic model. Uh, the Orthodox community that wanted to institute the, uh, uh, the, the, the ELF made a contract with the public utility poles uh, company, Verizon, which later got invalidated after the debate started. And then, uh, as Professor Friedman mentioned, the, the opponents incorporated themselves as a Jewish people opposed to the Elwulf, which also at times was a Jewish people for the betterment of West Hampton Beach. And so they filed a complaint with US District Court on establishment grounds, as noted in the email to me. Um, and on two grounds, number one, the public property and public display, the using of the public polls, but then also of, um, of government getting entangled in an intra-religious dispute, Reformed Jews versus uh, Orthodox Jews, <laughs> and that, uh, that is against the Establishment Clause. So that lawsuit was filed in July last year, but in the meantime, uh, last week actually got dismissed. So um, no, none of the ELF cases in, in, in the courts has ever sort of succeeded on Establishment Courts. So I, I should say now, I extracted myself from this, even though I could have, um, I could have earned my son's college money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, what I was very excited about, since at Stanford we have the ongoing debate of what really is still the justification of the humanities, and here was a moment of applied humanities, finally, <laughs> uh, um, my scholarship had made it. <laughs> So Michael can say something about the significance of this being uh, a, a cited in a brief. But anyhow, so Michael uh, wrote a, a, this, the op-ed piece that was mentioned already earlier, which I in principle agree with, but I wanted to ex extract myself from that whole case because in the end I think it's really more about uh, the social uh, issues rather than the constitutionality of the institution of the, um, the ELF. And here we say, contrary to Ibu Patel's um, ironic picture of uh, how religious communities get along so well. Here you would have an example where some people have cl uh, claimed that the body polit politic of my Hampton Beach is permanently uh, damaged. So a couple more minutes, um, which is uh, much more can be said in terms of the extended ethnography of this case. Uh, and this was just a brief uh, uh, narrative, but I'm not an ethnographer. Uh, and I just want to point out here that the literature is really growing. There was a long controversy in London, 15 years stretched out in the, in, in the media. That was a case where there was really non-Jewish, a uh, heavy non-Jewish involvement, not just an in intra-Jewish uh, uh, um, uh, controversy. And that has been doc um, do uh, documented and discussed in this dissertation. There's no elf right now in, in Germany, but there is one in a German-speaking country in Vienna. Uh, that was just instituted by Rabbi Minz uh, last, or was is, uh, instrumental there uh, um, last year. And there's Erovin, urban Erovin all, uh, uh, all over the place. Uh, and there's more literature, and, and the, the, the groups that have recently become very interested in this is also conceptual architects who have arguably written the most intelligent and sophisticated interpretation of what all this is about, and then um, artists. And there were a couple of exhibitions this year and whatnot. So the establishment of an elf in a community can, uh, in a community can serve as a gauge for social uh, two things for the social fabric of the Jewish community, and that is the Jew versus Jew uh, issue. 
uh, and this is the most pronounced so far, I think, in the West Hampton Beach controversy. I'm not sure that that's true in the Palo Alto controversy, and the Palo Alto controversy is really what got me uh, uh, interested in this to begin with, where there were some prominent Jewish voices in this, uh, but it was it really drew in uh, the entire community. And the one issue I want to mention to you, since, uh, since that has become recently an issue, is what actually is affected publicly by, uh, by the ELF is the, the question of property value, which uh, has not been considered for a long while, right? That a lot of people are anxious about their property value going up or down, uh, and since I'm not an economist, and I can barely understand my own paycheck, uh, I have to still uh, figure out that issue. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's not just uh, in between Jew and Jew, but between Jew and non-Jews. Uh, as I pointed out, we have the symbolic rent. And so here I want to, uh, at the end, read one, uh, at the beginning of one document, which I love, which uh, our wonderful librarian got to me at some point, uh, which is the rental contract um, that the Congregation Kesha Yisrael in Washington instituted signed by no lesser than the President of the United States, George Bush the Elder, uh, which in that rental contract, I mean the symbolic contract, uh, he starts this out by, uh, I'm pleased to send greetings to the congregation in Kesha Israel and to the Orthodox Jewish community in Washington as you celebrate the inauguration of the first Eruv in the District of Columbia. This construction, uh, the, the construction of this Eruv is particularly significant not only because it marks the growth of the Orthodox Jewish community in Washington, but also because the city is our nation's capital. Indeed, there is a long tradition linking it. And now the beautiful moment is that, is that the voice of George Bush Sr., President George Bush Sr., quotes the response that attributed to Rabbi Moses Seufer, the Chassim Seufer, and gives you a long paragraph from his tshuva <laughs> on the issue of the, uh, 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 of the elf in press work, and the press work. And so he concludes, now you have built this elf in Washington, and the territory it covers includes the Capitol, the White House, the Supreme Court, and many other federal buildings. And it, it promotes family values. That's how he... Now, of course, George Bush never saw this document. <laughs> the rabbi of that synagogue is Rabbi Barry Freundel, who was a ghostwriter for the document, but there was non-Jewish governmental representative involvement in this. So here we have an, an example of the establishment of, a new, uh, of an Eruv with no controversy, and that's not worthy, and these great US, uh, United States accommodating the religious needs and rituals based on the prerequisites of halacha. Now, some of this depends on how the, the, how the negotiations are con conducted, how the nature of the ritual institution and the mechanism, mechanisms of halakha are communicated, but in some of it on the social fabric of the local community and the standing of the Orthodox community or its leaders in that community. So with that, I want to conclude um, and we can discuss the issues. We can open it up for questions. Uh, maybe a couple of minutes for questions for Charlotte in particular before we open it up. Michael, do you want to say something about the brief? <laughs> <laughs> just a brief. Oh, just a brief. What I'm going to say, I was it, I, I, um, a friend of mine does, is doing a litigation in New York for the air, and one day he sends me a brief. He's like, "What is this? He's never seen anything like it. It's the most extraordinary brief I've ever seen." And there's two pages cited in a legal brief from Sharp, some Charlotte's work. I said. It's literally the most extraordinary placement of uh, academic work of all time. So I think they should put that front and center in Stanford's magazine to show that uh, like, applied yeah. humanities is no better example of it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you alluded to uh, what I said yesterday, and you're right, this is a Sabbath thing that's not strictly private. Uh, the difference, however, is where something like marriage is something that Jews have to engage in, uh, they don't necessarily have to uh, have, have, have an error. But the point I want to make is uh, as follows. What has happened, and I've been involved in some of this on a, on a practical level, um, non-Jews uh, rarely are concerned about this at all. Uh, they don't want to be perceived as anti-Semites, so they're probably not. And, and why not, you know? And, you know, you'll have a concession that there should be a Christmas tree, you know, uh, in, in the public square. This is understood. What is the real objection is are many non-Orthodox Jews who see their neighborhoods being, as it were, taken over by Orthodox Jews that make them feel uncomfortable. You know, as, as, as one man stated to me, I can't wash my car on, 
on the Saturday anymore. People that my neighbors stare at me. Uh, so therefore, they would much rather have non-Jewish neighbors who are not going to call their lifestyle into question as opposed to... So it becomes an interesting factor where <coughs> halakha does not unite the Jewish community, it divides it. Uh, in the same way that a bet din, uh, that Rabbi Roy was uh, uh, pointing out, yes, that's very interesting to bring people together. However, if the bet din is a bet din of a certain denomination, and then a denomination within a denomination, very few people outside of that Jewish denomination are going to go to that bet din. Uh, so therefore, the idea that it brings people together is, 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 uh, is not the case. Right. Ah, thank you, yeah. Uh, no, you're totally right. I, uh, but I, I, you could add to that, I think, that this is actually a structural part of the, the thing itself, because already the rabbinic, uh, I don't want to say invention, but the, the, the rabbinic sort of, um, well, let me say around, uh, invention of the, of the elves as a way to circumvent uh, what was broadly accepted Jewish law across the right, Sadducees, the uh, that, That's all, but Sadducees can't participate in this. Sadducees can't uh, participate, right? So it, in its very nature, it is actually arguably sectarian, right? That it's only the rabbis, so they set it up. But they have to, in the end, uh, rabbinic law sets itself up as sort of arguing, no, it goes back to uh, the times of uh, King Solomon, yeah. not to, to sort of uh, argue right that it's long tradition, but in the end, the thing itself is really a, 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 a sectarian, uh, uh, right, uh, originally, which uh, at least it's a sectarian thing. Just, just on this, uh, in this point, when our A. Rubin Lakeview in Chicago, we went to the Chicago City Council with the Reform Rabbi and Conservative Rabbi and, and me. So um, it, um, I think it, it, it can uh, lead to disunity, but it can also be a unifying force, even if um, I think uh, Reform Jews in general don't need an Eruv on Shabbat, but I think, you know, also if you want to be a more homiletical with the meaning of Eruv, of community, and of also creating a uh, public space into a private space or the equivalent, um, and this shared meal. So I think if we work more on the, uh, the this sort of homiletical or this meaning of it, uh, maybe a deeper meaning, then it can be more of a unifying thing, and it can speak to Jews, non-religious Jews, non-observant Jews, reform, conservative, and orthodox. Sam, and then questions for everyone. Well, the exchange between Shalonta and David made me think about something that actually I don't know what to do with it, but it could raise an issue of great interest for the whole themes of this conference. We've been thinking, I'd say I've been thinking, I think just something we've all been thinking about law primarily in terms of an instrument of coercion. This is always that, but certainly the tensions that can come up between, I'll say, Jewish and Islamic law and American law have to do with, on the one hand, uh, feeling that American law is coercing the religious structure of uh, Jews and Muslims, on the other hand, a fear that the Jewish and Muslim legal structures will themselves be coercive to minorities in their community and so forth. But there's another way by which we influence one another that's been really important to religious communities particularly, that to use a Foucauldian term, I can say, I put it in terms of surveillance, but basically, you know, when it used to be, you lived in a Christian country, in a Christian neighborhood, everybody went to church, you didn't go to church, somebody's going to look at you and say, why don't you, why don't you go to church? You know, it's not, you feel pressure. And if you're an atheist, or if you are a disbeliever, or a skeptic, or a heretic, it makes you uncomfortable, right? And that's been a feature for life for centuries, and e even into the present day, it's a feature in many rural communities, and some people who are outside their religious norms move into the urban center, especially now that it's filled with lots of cosmopolitan people, Sometimes that's a euphemism for Jews, but <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, people who don't fit, and then they can be comfortable in their heterodox practices. Well, that's what's going on. I mean, it's a restoring of that old-fashioned community that you get when the air is up, or you can get, mm -hmm. and that was what leads to the guy not being willing to, uh, being very uncomfortable washing his car. So it seems to me that, that one of the interesting things that's going on is to what extent. Do we want to disperse, dissolve, get rid of the aspect of monitoring one another that has been very important for keeping religious communities together in the past? What, do I think that it's going to be things a good thing that liberal democracy 
especially in its urban centers, tends to disperse that and to what extent is that a loss? Yeah, um, I mean, that's a good question. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, one of the issues, uh, since that comes up a lot, right? I mean, West Hampton Beach, as I say, is social engineering. So it's it, 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 instituting the ELF is about change. Something changes, usually more orthodox will ju uh, use. I mean, the argument is made that more orthodox will move to town. And so therefore, right, you get more of that scenario of surveillance in theory. Uh, which I have not found a single study yet that sort of demonstrates that actually more orthodox do move to town or that an ortho right that uh, that the presence of an elf it may uh, sway you to move to this side of the street rather than to that side of the street which they right someone demonstrated that in in, in Sharon uh, in in Boston in the neighborhood there in Sharon Heights uh, but it doesn't per se, uh, right, and, and that study still has to be done, how it really realistically, I mean, I don't know how, but uh, influences sort of these kind of demographic patterns and therefore, in theory, is really about uh, social engineering, right, versus it sort of creates a signature to, somewhat, uh, to something that already exists. There is an orthodox uh, community in town. There is, right, and it's these people who live there who want the elephants, so it, it's more about that rather than uh, creating the ha more, more of a degree of surveillance, uh, right, or, or, or changing it uh, uh, towards, that, um, towards that. Of course, I mean, I, I guess in the end you would argue that just the, the fact that more people supposedly are on the streets, uh, now, right, in, that, in London, in, in the London controversy, came up again again. I don't want to see Jews walking, uh, uh, right, more, uh, these religious Jews walking outside all the time on the, on the Sabbath and whatnot. But, it, it, right, it, it's just not a realistic kind of, uh, I think, I think in the end, it's not a real, realistic issue. Um, actually, I think this point that um, Sam raised is really quite common. Like we, it comes up in the hijab cases in Europe, mm -hmm. because the idea, for example, that Turkey gave in defense of prohibiting hijab in universities was that it made not hijab wearing women uncomfortable to the point that they couldn't study properly. Because the idea is that even if hijab wearing women doesn't say anything, it expresses a certain view of religion that the non hijab wearing woman will internalize as personal criticism of her, right? And so that justifies, that's an infringement of her right, right, to sort of be free of religious proselytization or proselytizing discourse while she's at university, and so therefore it's reasonable to prohibit hijab. Um, I mean, I don't think that, that applies in the United States, but that, that same kind of logic is that, and you see sometimes the Supreme Court of Human Rights, when they analyze freedom of religion, they say, um, freedom of religion is also very valuable for non-religious, the right to be free from religion, right? And part of being free from religion is that you don't have religious messages being communicated to you, sort of in an unwanted way, in the way that maybe this, this I, my understanding is it's a, it's a fish line that you can't even see. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. Um, Anyway, right? Yeah, no, I, 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 I totally. Tr tr um, I thought of something else to create the parallel there, but I, right, because that, that, that uh, but tr just on the last point, the visibility. I mean, first of all, the visibility issue is something that the John Stewart clip picks up on and just skewers. Uh, so you have to watch it on YouTube um, <laughs> because, but you have to know where it is because otherwise, you see, um, I mean, unless you know where it is. But you could argue, actually, now that the maps of the Elvin are up, right, you could go on the maps of congregation, Kesha, Israel, there's a map, so that creates a different kind of visibility in the urban landscape. Uh, or Palo Alto, actually, they didn't put up the, the map uh, on, their, on their website because they were so worried after all the controversy and the Geschrei against it that right, people would uh, uh, sabotage. Um, which sabotage the elf. So you actually really literally have to know where it is to see it. So the, the visibility, the, uh, I mean, it becomes visible but only at that one moment of where the thing gets negotiated. And after that, right, it, it's sort of, it's just sort of integrated into the urban landscape. But the issue that I was going to raise as a parallel, I think, because in part, the anxiety that comes up around the elf is also 
sort of now the uh, and I think Professor Friedman mentioned that right, the, the Orthodox community only does at a moment where it feels comfortable enough, maybe arguably in the social body of the of the city, but it sort of creates a symbolic uh, right permanence. So now they're here and they're putting up this thing, which in the end is actually not a permanent boundary, but it creates that kind of sense. And I think what I was thinking about as a structural parallel is uh, the arguments about now that the Turkish Muslims in Germany are building mosques and all of a sudden mosques are, right, they become a symbol of, uh, of the permanence of these people that were uh, uh, formerly guest workers, so to speak. And not only that, they're changed, they're radically supposed to change, that's the argument, the, the skyline. And we are so obsessed with our skylines, right, in the, in the, the, the issue around uh, in the mosque in, in Cologne, which is UNICEF protected with the cathedral in the middle, which already, I mean, there's all kinds of sky, uh, right, um, skyscrapers around it anyhow, but there that issue about the minaret was, oh my God, now right, the, the Muslims are visible in the, in, in the urban landscape. Sort of. So th there's a sort of, also that moment of these people are now building buildings here and therefore that means they're, to stay, they're here to stay. And so that's, I think, also an aspect of that. If that makes sense. Maybe we could ask, uh, we could allow Charlotte to, <laughs> to sit down. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, thank you. <laughs> Let's go through and address your questions to any of our three panelists. Yes. Uh, a couple of brief sociological observations about Hebrew issues. I hope the Muslim participants are not totally bored to death by this. In terms of sectarianism, I believe Rabbi Lopet is mentor of Arnold Solveig and other center and right orthodox rabbis are against a ruby in any major city. So it isn't that all orthodox Jews, a very important large group, are against, believe it's not permissible to do it in this... Uh, Lithuania. Right. And, 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 and many Hasidim. And many Hasidim also. Wait, but some of those are technical issues, right? right but, but they're insurmountable technical issues. In a large city, you just can't do it according to Right. I also, mean, in, in some contexts, it turns into an issue of uh, religious territoriality. My um, is better than you. Right. Well, so that's therefore, for <laughs> things like that. Uh, also, as an Orthodox Jew, I do have some sympathy with the Reform Jews who don't want to have an Arab in their community because it does. I, I really think you're wrong. That it, it causes Orthodox Jews to move in to or move around in Toronto and Skokie and Riverdale and Beagle Robertson. I mean, Sam and Mark and Rabbi Belinsky and I from our or small Orthodox community in Evanston are praying to be able to set up a new there because we hope that many families actually will move from Riverdale. I mean, from uh, Lakeview. But it really affects, you know, as people have said, if you, if you have little kids, the, the, the mother in most cases has to stay at home. So it's a very important thing, and it really does draw attention. to it. But I'm sympathetic with the people who don't want that. For example, you have the situations in northern New Jersey and Long Island where communities have been taken over by Orthodox Jews, who then ran for the school board, and because their kids all go to day school yeshivas, slashed the budgets for everybody else. So, and, 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 and total transformation of what kinds of stores we're selling, which kinds of foods and things there. So I understand why they're, they're, they're you know, worried about No, I see that. Overrun. I just haven't seen a demographic study that demonstrates that. Well, I've, I, I'm anecdotally, well, I, I think every Orthodox Jewish can give you dozens of examples. I also think some of those communities that you're pointing to um, are, might be Haredi communities that don't accept the Aru. You know, they've moved in for different reasons. That's why this study is so difficult. There's so many different factors why they're moving into those areas. Yeah, it's not the five areas. towns is mostly modern Orthodox people, but... Yeah, that's for the microphone for Lena. On the first slide, if you talk, the Sharia being equal to Torah and then Halakha to Fika. How about if uh, Sharia and Fika is more to Halakha and Quran is to Torah? Uh, that well, I'm basing it on um, daily, so I'm basing it on what rabbinic jurists living in the Islamic world who spoke Arabic, who wrote in Arabic, would conceptualize it. So I think. But you won't be wrong to do it. Then. Well, it's because it's a different. There's oral Torah and written Torah, so that's there's a different conceptualization of Torah built in that um, that's also there within Shania, right? Where people sort of say Shania, they also, also kind of think about Quran, um, but the. So the point is that it's really, it is Shariah Torah, uh, in, a, in a sort of general way. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, I had a comment for uh, Rabbi Lepatin, and then I had a question for Rabbi Lepatin for Dr. Slema. Uh, so one, just uh, on the uh, argument that you made earlier about public space versus private space, a colleague of mine at the University of Pennsylvania has done some research on the jury robust synagogue and has shown that actually it's basically just a house. It's a uh, the structure. No, no, which synagogue? I'm sorry, the jury robust synagogue. Right. So one of the one of the oldest uh, surviving synagogues in existence actually is structured um, within a private dwelling, mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. there's at least some precedent for that. Mm -hmm. um, the question was, I'm just wondering in terms of the way that you formulate your argument. Um, um, and your kind of self-definition as, as making an orthodox argument that there are, um, there have been Jewish legal, let me say that carefully, Jewish legal uh, arguments um, made on similar issues that come out of conservative circles, uh, that come out of, you know, um, rabbis like uh, Rabbi Daniel Sperber um, a decade ago, more recently um, uh, in, out of the non-denominational movements such as Mahon Hadar, uh, Rabbi Ethan Tucker and Rabbi uh, uh, Michael Rosenberg have made arguments, all of which uh, are very much in conversation with the sources that you're bringing. So I'm kind of wondering um, how you form formulate the limits of your discourse, and I'm wondering this partially in connection to, to um, what Lena said earlier. Um, what does it mean to, to think about one's law um, and where denomination fits into that? Because it seems like, it seems like in some sense, if the boundaries are defined um, so, uh, socially in terms of like who is orthodox, then um, there is this there is a kind of separate element. It's not purely legal, unless um, the definitions of what it means to have an orthodox legal interpretation versus another legal interpretation are made explicitly legal and not religious. It's a great, uh, it's a, a difficult question, and I appreciate it because I think that. Uh, there is that element of sort of the orthodox culture and the orthodox world and uh, not being open to arguments from outside. Um, and uh, certainly uh, on a specific issue, like if there's a conservative scholar or a non-observant, non-denominational scholar who points to a text, let's say the Meiri, uh, once I use a mode of Professor Halbertal, has some evidence from the Meiri about did you can cook for Gentiles on the, set, on, on the on holidays. On Yom Tov, and I showed it to Ramosha Salvechik, and he took it seriously. So, on a very specific, but on matters kind of uh, of judgment, uh, uh, then it, it's much more a cultural thing. Uh, Rav Daniel Sperber is definitely within the Orthodox culture, but he's not seen as a posek, as a halachic authority there. Um, I'm, I mean, are we being recorded here? I you know, I, uh, Ethan Tucker actually happens to have Orthodox ordination, and I asked some of his uh, rabbi, there was a question that came up that, uh, hi Ethan, that um, <laughs> Ethan was on a bait dean, uh, and the question came up uh, to another uh, Orthodox authority, can you, is on a Jewish court for a conversion, is he acceptable? And, and this person says, yes, he's part of the Orthodox world. So. Um, one uh, way of doing this, uh, of sort of opening up the Jewish uh, legal world, is um, to be adventurous and really to look at different sources from outside the Orthodox world. Um, and I'm not sure how effective that's going to be within the Orthodox community. So I'm sort of looking for efficacy within the Orthodox community. And to do that, I kind of want to take the approach of bringing an Ethan Tucker into the Orthodox world and say, no, he's really Orthodox, or this tshuva that he wrote, this responsum that he wrote about egalitarianism is a very Orthodox responsum. So um, I, I take what you say really seriously, and I think that um, effectively to convince, to, to have movement within the Orthodox community, people are going to have to feel comfortable that these are sort of Orthodox authorities, but it's a very, it's a very good point. In the back. Yes. Questions for the first speaker. Um, the arrest that you were referring to with respect to the affiliations game, where are those taking place? Everywhere in the U.S. And I'm mostly talking about um, individuals who have basically been subjected to forms of entrapment where they're usually young kids who go to mosques and um, have espoused certain ideological positions but haven't actually done anything. 
um, but they happen to be talking to FBI informants without knowing it, and then have been subjected to various kinds of um, convictions for terrorism. Right, but what about like the gang, the central gang stuff? Because the gang here has been found unconstitutional. Are there other places where they are stopping for some, just In LA, is, for example. LA yes. is, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Also? Uh, yeah, the first question for Lee and then for by um, Asher as well. Um, you mentioned, um, if I understood correctly, uh, it's, you know, these terms are better translated than rather than they are left untranslated. But I wonder, because of their politicized and exoticized nature, but I wonder if that's a bit of a defeatist attitude. And instead of that, we should be attempting to, there's a need to redeem these terms and maybe clarify them in conferences such as this. Um, so that's why, for example, the, the title of the conference, not that I considered it provocative, but if it was considered provocative by people, then that gives them the chance to come here and listen and then seek a clarification of what these terms mean, not necessarily by spending time defining them, but just by the sub subjects that these cover. So that's one thing. The second thing about the law was, uh, in early Orientalism and views on, on Islamic law, um, Orientalists never really dealt with the ritual side, the ibadat side of the law, because they just couldn't conceive but what their conception of law was, just didn't fit with that, so forget that, that's not law. So they only dealt with the Muhammadah, the, the, the issues with the transactions and dealings and capital punishments, uh, sorry, yeah, punishments, criminal law, and so on. However, I think there's a shift now, and some views of uh, modern Western academics on Islamic law don't like to call fiqh or sharia law because it also deals with, it in a positive way rather, because it goes above and beyond what conceptions of law are, such as the way Tim mentioned, categories of uh, moral moral categories as well, such as dislike and prefer, if we can call them uh, moral categories, they don't use them in terms of classical Islamic law, or moral. So in a positive sense rather, they think that it's something even perhaps more profound than what we conceive as what law is, because it contains moral guidance as well. And a question for, uh, or a point on a uh, fantastic presentation uh, made by Ashley as well as, as the other two. Um, yeah, we have the, it's interesting, we have the tradition that a, a, a woman should make a, a kind of a masjid or a, a prayer niche in her home. So if there is this idea of kind of a private place of worship. What, what I think is quite interesting is that since the Amina Wadud case, the, the debates around women leading prayer have kind of receded, especially in the UK, I don't know about, I don't know about the States. So we don't really have that debate as much anymore. And uh, as Professor Novak said, women are finding other ways for their religious, intellectual, spiritual fulfillment. There's more public presence of women in, in, in speeches, in gatherings, and learning, in institutions. So, so that's happening quite a lot. But if this kind of, I think, perhaps in a couple of generations, if women start calling this, I think your model is very interesting because the, the, the interpretation of Dar, which you mentioned, which was, which, was, which was spot on regarding the discussion, People have said, or scholars have said, that that, that refers specifically to um, women who are like relatives or who are <coughs> within the private domain of the, of, of the house. So I can see possibly scholars interpreting maybe a, a section of the mosque or a building if there's some kind of private membership in the way that you, in the way that you mentioned. And then that could perhaps act as the dar as well, because you know who the members are, who they all are. It's not guests, because people say there shouldn't be strangers. The women in the house means you can't invite strangers, for example. So that means it's not no longer private. So if it's kind of a membership way of doing this thing in a community, then I can see how the model may, may work, if there's the need for that. But at the moment, it doesn't seem to be that women are calling for, you know, to be imams and whatever. But then, you know, there's the also the argument they can't leave the obligatory prayers, some, some people start to say it should be only the, the optional prayers and, uh, and so on. So, okay, I'll start with your um, second point. So I, I, there are Orientalists who dealt with ritual, and actually there's a, an interesting story there about people like Goldsier, who was a Reformed Jew and was very much interested in um, reforming Judaism through his study of Islam. So I, I don't think, I wouldn't make that kind of blanket statement. Yeah, not, not, not all of them. Of right, yeah. about Orientalists have to ritual. I think you're getting the moral category from what had that. And I take that as a valid point, but the, but the point is that secular law also has morality. So it's not that somehow Islamic law or Jewish law are quite distinct because they have moral values and them. all legal systems have moral values. Um, I think that Wad's position on these issues has more to do with his critique of modernity and his critique of the modern nation state. And so for an engagement with that, I would actually have a follow review of Wad's book. 
um, which I think addresses some of these issues, right, if I remember correctly, on the, on the sort of categorization of law. Um, but, the, but the point being that I, I don't think that Wedden is trying to say that it's not law, it's more than law. It, it's just that the law is infused with morality, which is true for lots of legal systems. On the defeatist issue, I don't think that this is a matter simply of, well, there, the market uses this term, so you should use the term because then you would uh, draw attention uh, towards your valid use of the term in some way, and that that way you're just sort of engaging with the market. Because I think that there's something much more insidious in the use of the term sharia in the contemporary political world. So just as an example, Bin Laden in his fatawa, his legal decrees, uses the term sharia to describe his opinions. Now that's a really... Um, that's something that, we, that's, that could easily be contested, both on the grounds of the fact that he doesn't really have jurisprudential training and it's questionable whether he should even be making a legal opinion to begin with. But second, that the claim that it's sharia and not that it's fiqh and that doesn't follow, like if you read the legal opinions at the end, he doesn't actually say things like, and God knows best, for example, right? That he doesn't have this kind of recognition of the sharia fiqh distinction, which is something that we know is typical of Salafis, means that when we engage in this kind of terminology, that we're not just sort of using Sharia in an innocent way, but we're actually intervening in that political discourse and legitimating the erasure of fit as a term. And that happens more often in English than it would in Arabic, because in Arabic people conceptualize that there's Sharia and then there's fit, and then that sort of native discourse, those things continue to exist. But in Western discourse, because there is no flip equivalent when you use Sharia, it's sending a far more insidious political message than I think most people realize. Um, just sorry, did you want to, was there a second part of the question? Yeah, I was wondering, thank you, I, I want to follow that up, thank, thank you very much. And uh, you know, it's, uh, this has been a, I talk about this, this sort of the private public thing, but it, uh, some people know, I talk over the years, it tried to get into this journal and that journal and this journal and that journal and finally um, it was in a journal, it was supposed to be in a journal, uh, a women's rabbin a rabbinical school actually uh, and there weren't enough women in that journal so they threw out all the journals and they're redoing it so uh, one day, but maybe I should publish it in an Islamic journal and uh, I'm there a lot. I just, I wanted to draw a um, connection between um, uh, Lena and Rabbi Lopatin's discussions. Lena made a plea that we should um, call, uh, use the labels Jewish, Jewish law and Islamic law in order to break down this barrier and make people realize that we're really talking about the same genre. And I think in response to that, Sam and Mark raised the question that actually there are differences. The difference isn't necessarily secular and religious. The difference is state law and non-state law. And um, the difference between state law and non-state law I think is highlighted by the question that Rabbi Lopatin was fielding which is what makes uh, your particular you know, halachic view on this a legitimate or an orthodox halachic view. And in state law, these questions are much more easily settled because the highest court in the jurisdiction decides whether or not a particular view is the law or just an interesting legal opinion by some outlier. And in non-state law, we have a problem that we don't actually have reference to a decision maker like that. And another example of non-state law that was brought up was international law. This is a notorious problem in international law, and it's given rise to the debate as to whether international law is law at all. And um, the roots of this, in at least the Jewish law field, go back 35 years to Robert Cover's essay in Nomos and Narrative, in which I think what he wanted to do was to collapse the distinction, at least as a genre category, between states' law and these other laws of the Orthodox world or the Mennonite world or any other world, and um, he viewed the difference between being able to declare what the law is in the state law side and not being able to as a, um, a way in which state law is jurispathic, that state law actually is in the business of destroying alternative views of law in order to establish what the appropriate law is. And I think that it's interesting that in some ways we're coming back to the question that he raised, but with the benefit of 25 or 35 years of a lot more sophistication in our discussion of Jewish and Islamic law in relation to what we study in law schools. And this desire to break down that barrier, I think, is exactly the thing that motivated that essay 35 years ago, which in many ways launched the Jewish law discourse in American law schools. Shlomo. Um, yeah, I'm really, Alina, really sympathetic to, to that argument, um, your argument, and particularly um, the highlighting the distinctions between the Sharia and Fifth and Torah and Halakha, uh, which we discussed a little bit. Um, a couple of nights ago. Um, I wonder, however, whether 
translating or using the terms Jewish law um, and more particularly Islamic law are any better. Uh, um, from my experience, and I'm very conscious of this in my own writing, but from my experience, um, using the term Islamic law is often then confused with, well, with Islamic law, that's what they do in Iraq, that's what they do in Saudi Arabia. Um, although the proper terminology for that, I guess, would be the law of Muslim majority countries, or the state law of, of this country, yeah, that yeah. country, it's not, it, it, these things that are associated with the term Islamic law do not reflect fifth, uh, of course, but I, I think that's the baggage that the term often carries, and I wonder if there's any, I guess, convenient way of, if you think there's any convenient way of, of kind of detaching the one from the other. I don't think using the term Jewish law has the same problem, um, because I think there's a generally um, a much more of a recognition that Jewish law does not mean the law of the state of Israel. It, it means something religious, but on the other time, I get a lot of pushback when, whenever I use the term Islamic religious law. So I talk about that in my article, Commodified, um, the, the Commodified Islamic Law in the U.S. Legal Academy, where I explain that there is Islamic jurisprudence and then what I call Muslim legalities. And Islamic jurisprudence refers to that jurisprudential methodology, so and the, develop, the development of laws through a particular methodology, through using the Islamic canonical text. But what you would describe as, so the thing like Iran, I would say that's part of Middle Eastern law, contemporary law in Middle Eastern states, or contemporary law in Muslim majority states, as you alluded to. And those are referred to Muslim legality. So I think that there is a way to create a terminological distinction, and I have done it in that essay. Yep. Uh, just a couple of points on Rabbi Asher's uh, discussion. Uh, one is that uh, I think what you said about Ahmad is interesting, but a uh, Muslim mosque really does not have any membership. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, very few mosques even in the, in the United States will have membership. So the mosque is, and, and because of high degree of mobility, the mosques are becoming more and more anonymous places. We really don't know who are these thousand people who are coming to the mosque. So I think that interpretation is practically very hard to apply. That mosque is an extended family, really the people we know. The second question about uh, the Muslim women leading prayer. Uh, one problem, I mean, besides the legal discourse of ijtihad and reinterpretation, one problem which we have is that if the Muslim community in the United States, particularly after post 9 11 situation, is highly suspected by the mainstream Muslim community in the Muslim world. This is a very important point. So many of the understandings and interpretations which will be do here under the pressures of pluralism or secularization are seen by the Muslim world part of our ability that we can't really function as a Muslims in American society. So we are under pressure somehow to uh, distort our religion. So uh, if this kind of uh, interpretation or practice comes from Saudi Arabia or if it comes from Qom in Iran, it will have certainly some legitimacy. But uh, an American woman converting to Islam and leading prayer is really an aberration. I, I really don't think it carries any weight in the broader Islamic world. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I am, I'm trying to because the parallel to uh, in the Jewish world between Israel and the diaspora Interestingly, this this kind of uh, service where a woman leads for men and women, but it's an orthodox-looking service because there's a mechitza, there's a divider, started almost simultaneously in Jerusalem and New York. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, I think they're actually America, at least America and Israel, are moving in that in, in the same direction, the same speed, really. Um, but the thing about the uh, mosques public, yeah, I think thank you, that was helpful. I wonder if, um, you know, in the future, next generation, that model will work um, for the Muslim world. I know that in um, 
50 years ago, the model of American synagogues were these huge, sprawling synagogues. Now an organization called Synagogue 3000 came out with a report that it's really all about relationships, you know, and, and Jewish organizations and synagogues are going to survive if you can create those relationships, not fancy programmings or dynamic speakers or anything like that. So um, I don't know, you know, the, the culture uh, and the sociology in, in, in uh, the Islamic world, the Muslim world in America, but it might be that there needs there will need to be a shift or, uh, as Mustafa said, to uh, a, um, a slight change in having a sense of membership, at least in a part of the, mo the mosque. I, I couldn't speak to that, but it, it, it was an in it's been an interesting evolution in the Jewish community. Well, part of the whole, maybe. Yeah. You know, if there's a space in the home. Right, right, right. I just have a, um, a question for Lena. And <laughs> so, um, it, and it's, I guess it's also a question perhaps partly for Michael. So I understand you making sort of a uh, suggested two-step uh, uh, transformation, right, from Sharia halakha to Jewish law or Islamic law, and then from that to um, state versus non-state law. That was just something that you alluded to at the very end. And um, that echoed Michael's suggestion um, that we should demystify religious law, think more in terms of it's, it's just law. And I, I, I want to... Um, I want to ask how far you push that, and also um, uh, sound something of a, uh, of a of an alarm. And the alarm is that um, there's uh, uh, the, you know, religion is treated differently within um, within our American system. And um, although it uh, uh, you know for for sociological purposes, for example, I think that um, most members of religious communities don't feel that they opt into um, religious traditions in the same way that my kids might opt into the Boy Scouts. And, um, uh, you know, to the extent you want to erase or eliminate um, the religion category, it seems to me that, um, that there's, uh, there's, there's, there's genuine risk that's posed um, to, the, to the religious communities. Um, so I, I don't know how far you, um, you hope to um, eliminate religion and remake it entirely as a, a you know, a, a dichotomy of state, non-state, um, but I'd be curious to hear. And related to that, one of the one really great presentation that we gave is very interesting. And it's interesting to me to, to see etymologically that um, the source of maybe religion secular uh, language might um, be racial. But, you know, I understand, notwithstanding its source, um, that, you know, we own the meanings of words. Uh, they, 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 they develop, they have different, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not tethered to the source. And so the mere fact that the source might be problematic doesn't mean that that kind of conceptual distinction um, between, for example, religious and secular can't be meaningful, doing real analytical work, being, again, a useful dichotomy. So um, uh, historical source and the analytical usefulness of that source, it seems to me, are, you know, are, are two separate matters. And so I'm just curious what you have to th say about those two things. Okay, so I, I understand um, that you, you you want to sort of hold on to the usefulness of it. But I, I think that the, what I'm saying is that you can't separate analytical categories from political discourse. And what I tried to do was not only show you the historical genealogy of religious and secular in the Aryan Semite um, world, and that's something that has been worked out by Gilan Ajar in his book on Semites, but, so that I'm really just taking it up from him, but also to show you the contemporary manifestations. So the point of the circumcision case study is precisely to show you the ways in which discussions about religion actually do sort of manifest a certain sort of racial um, categories, right? That, and that also the, the other example being the jihadi. So that there is a way in which the discourse on religion is used and has traditionally been used for imperialist purposes, right? Something, that's, not something, that's not a surprise. It's definitely used part of, uh, part of imperialist conquer and divide strategies and continues to be used in certain ways for political gains. So it's not that I want to erase religious, the religious category completely, but that I want us to be far more suspicious about how we use it and far more careful about when and how we use it. So there are lots and lots of times, and I think that Michael's example, the, the case that he talked about, um, about the OBGYN yesterday, <coughs> is a perfect example of where religion gets stuck in where it's not about religion, 
right? And there's all sorts of ways that I think that we probably experience this in, um, in the academy, where people ask me questions about Islamic society or Islamic history, and I'm like, but that has nothing to do with religion. That has something to do with some economic situation, or that has something to do with a political situation. But religion becomes, unfortunately, a false causal explanation for all sorts of things that have nothing to do with religion. But the reason why it, does, it plays that role is precisely because of these kinds of racialized issues. Does that make sense? Does that answer that? Yeah, let me just say one thing about that. You know, the, the fact empirically that you show me a slide that admittedly um, uh, correlates religion with race is, is far... I need a lot more data to suggest that that's the ordinary association that people make, or that's the ordinary usage of the term. Mm -hmm. Although it's still, it was absolutely striking to see that. I'll just, I'll just add that. No. no, I understand completely. But I think you're being empirical about it. So I don't think that I need to show you that the majority of times when religion is used, it's used in racialized ways. I think that the fact that it's used in racialized ways quite often is sufficient for us to start questioning why it's being used in that way. Well, I don't even know that it's quite often. That's what I mean by empirical. Right, right. I mean, that, okay. So then. Then you can sort of write disagree about the amount. But right. I would also say that there's a way in which you can't empirically measure this because the point of that comic is that it happened to be that there's this one person who was brazen enough to talk to do the foreskin man comic, right? And put these <laughs> anti Semitic images out there. But most bigots aren't that obvious. Right, so there's a way in which you're asking me to measure something that actually cannot empirically be measured, that we need to be suspicious about it, because these are not the kinds of things that people are sort of obvious about, right? And that was also the point of me talking about the way in which secular discourse is used, right? The discourse of human rights was what was being used to attack sort of male circumcision practices, right? But really underneath all of this, and, and partly I know this because I participated in a conference on circumcision at UC Davis, and the people that were invited included people from the community who um, were involved in the anti-circumcision debate. And one of them was a Jewish physician from San Francisco who was against male circumcision, but who admitted to me, that, and, and to, the, you know, to the conference participants, that there were lots of people involved in the anti-circumcision debate who were really anti-Semitic. And that there was all sorts of anti-Semitic things being said at these meetings, and you know, not that you could record it. I mean, I'm not going to necessarily be able to find it online or, or find an empirical way to measure it. But that it's there, it's there. I mean, I don't think we can deny that it's there. The question then about its efficacy. The anti-Semitic is not racist, though. There's still a gap between the two. Uh, no, I, I would disagree with you yeah. on that because Semitic is understood as a race, and that's the whole point of Aryan versus Semitic discourse. Semites were invented as a racial category in this context of 19th century Europe in which Aryan was white and pure and, you know, the blonde foreskin man, basically, <laughs> right? And Semites were the other, the brown people. So Tim, Bruce, yeah, I just want to suggest that you could both be right. That is, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, is possible, it is possible that that one function or use of these categories is, uh, is for racial mm -hmm. power redistribution. And it's also possible that one use of these categories is um, for special designation of certain kinds of association that American political culture treats differently. And this is what related to what Charlotta talked about, which is, is that you know, if any group wants to put up some sort of mechanism that will allow them to collect, there are certain, you know, there are certain protections against uh, trying to stop that. But the protections are much higher if it's a religious group that would like to get together and use some public mechanism to do that. And so it's entirely possible that one of the costs of um, uh, calling things religion or religious law is, is that it, it becomes a proxy or a tool in the kind of racial dynamics you talk about. And at the same time, it plays a very special role in protecting certain kinds of associated groups or certain kinds of activities that it wouldn't in American political culture unless it was called religion. So it seems like it's a cost-benefit thing, not so much, you don't have to take one side. I mean, the question is, is it worth it? So that's, that is an empirical question, I think, and that would be hard to measure. You're right. <laughs> So we'll take one last one. Are you still interested? Um, he wants to speak. Now. No, no. I just, I, I, what was <laughs> I mean, I think what's interesting about those comics is not so much the uh, the villains, but the hero. I mean, could you imagine the foreskin <laughs> being like a brownie? It's sort of hard. No, he wouldn't. It's sort of hard to imagine foreskin man being a brownie, right? I think that's sort of the. That yeah. sort of point, wouldn't, which wouldn't really, I don't think it would go very far. <laughs> no, he's like a Superman Jesus. That's what he's supposed I mean, that's what he looks like, right? Okay, on that note. <laughs> So we have a 15-minute coffee break. Uh, please uh, 
Please yeah. reconvene in 15 minutes at 3 o'clock for the keynote. Yeah. 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 Yeah.